Thank you so much. I will start with the first one about separating biological family and establishing what they call spiritual family. Cult churches or these practices of this strange phenomenon that we are, we are faced with, they want control of a human being. That's what they want, full control. And full control, it means that they want to be the only voice that speaks over your life. So they will separate you, whether by prophecy, they will tell you that your grandmother is the one behind your failures, trying to separate you from your biological family. They will separate you from your biological family by saying that using scriptures, twisting scriptures, like we are not of this world. You know, they just take a portion of scripture and you start to see your family as your enemy. And once they have separated you, you become lonely and they are able to give you the care. Others, they tell you, move from where you stay, you must come and stay at the church premises. And once you stay at the church premises, they become your provider, they give you food, they give you clothes, and by giving you, you see them as a caring people. You trust them with your life. And the other reason is that once they've separated you from family is that whatever that they will do to you, you won't be able to share it with anybody because you are just alone. You came here looking for help and they are uh, abusing you and you can't share this. And others, it starts like this. They give you a prophecy and say, don't tell anybody this. They make appointments and say, don't tell even your husband about our appointment. So they try to cut away all people who are closer to you or who can be a shield to you. Remember, family is a shield. We are protected by people who are closer to us. So taking away the family, they are making you uh, to be alone. And they encourage you of what we call spiritual family. It goes back to the term of spiritual mother, spiritual father. Because you now belong into a family that you are not related by logical but you can uh, 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 you can stand and say this is my father and you reject your biological father who is seated next to you you take care of your spiritual father you don't take care of your biological father so they do that so that they can win and control your life now the rituals there are different types of rituals that are are used and they are sustainable in different ways there are rituals where you have to slaughter a cow, it needs blood. You have to uh, slaughter a, a, a cow or a goat or a chicken. You split that particular uh, blood on those altars. Remember, blood is life. Once you, you slaughter a blood on those, there is a pain that goes in the slaughtering process and from then the blood which is life of that particular animal is being given to this altar so by slaughtering you are giving life to this particular spirit the other rituals where they use human cements whether or human flute whether they come through a sexual act or whether they tell you to cut your hair, or whether they tell you to cut your nails. They, they use human uh, uh, flutes for rituals. That is the reason why you will hear of an instant where a pastor or a church leader can sleep with about seven women unprotected. Why? It is because what is needed is those human flutes that are taken to the altar and once they are taken to the altar the victims the victims are the ones who suffer because their lives now starts to struggle 
as the church leader becomes more prosperous and they maintain it through the very same act and the question was asked and said if a church leader dies what happens if those powers are not maintained chair it's a problem usually if a leader is about to die they have to go back to the house where the leader acquired power and there is a transference they must do that ritual but let's say the leader dies and they don't know what is happening but they know that the father was just using things what will happen mr chair is that one from the family to protect the secret of the family will be appointed to be a church leader without a calling or without a gift and as a church leader he will be he will be protecting the idol of the church or the god of the church but as time goes on there will be blood because these powers if you don't service them well they start to fight and destroy everything it has built so you will find that there are churches where people are fighting this division this there is this up and down it is because of you are no longer using the right methods to maintain this power now this power is fighting its own everything that the power has accumulated it has to be destroyed attacked by this kind of power so once the cult leader dies without initiating a follower it becomes a problem people die people kill each other there is a division whether you try to talk about it there can never be a union because the issue is the power thank you thank you so much uh, uh, apostle <clears throat> i want to ask a few questions um very instructive indeed the purpose is the conversation let's get the nation talking do we understand what we're talking about what we're entered into my first question uh, apostle what are the dangers associated with these practices, especially for social cohesion and nation building? And what are the risk, risks for a national um, uh, sovereignty, so to speak? national security because if you have got pockets and pockets of power would this not militate against a coup against the government of the day because of the pockets of power everywhere and they claim authority in other words you've got government within government or a society within society i just want to check are there dangers or nothing Thank you so much, Chair, for these interesting questions. The dangers. Church, churches were built to bring unity. Churches were, were built to restore communities. But these churches, they do the opposite. These churches divide a mother from their kids. These churches divide a husband from the wife. These churches are bringing division in our community rather than unity or national building. Why am I saying this? If you look lately on the media or if you look on social media, you are able to see the depth of these church members who are able to fight their own family member while they are protecting their spiritual father. So it, it, it shows and it sends a message, not only in a family setting, but also churches are divided. The same churches where we say we are all Christians, but we are divided. We are fighting because others are protecting a human being. We use the same Bible, but interpreting it in different forms. 
So the danger of these cults or mega churches, it is not every mega church that is part of the cult, but the danger is that they don't build our nation, but they divide the nation. That is what I can say. So the danger is that through their indoctrination or teachings, you are able to, to see division from families, division in communities, division also in, in religion. Because this one, it reminds me in the Bible where this one says, I am of Paul. So people come and say, I follow a human being. And they are proud to say, I am following this person. While others are saying, I am following Christ. So there is that division. The risk of the national security. In my second book, that is called Initiated by My Spiritual Father, I elaborate more on this. Because it is so sad that even politicians, they go to this church to acquire power, to get powerful positions in the country or in the world. So once politicians, they go there, we know these politicians as leaders or influential leaders. But once they are there, Mr. Chair and the commission, the same man that we look up to becomes a child. Because in that environment, you are a child of the spiritual father. So the politician decides to submit just because of spiritual advantage that he's looking for. And what is funny enough is during the one-on-one -on -one consultation, politicians or business people, they go, and say, I want to see the prophet. Then the prophet will come. And they sit. And where they sit in that room, there are civilians, there are cameras, there are tape recorders that are there. The politician will talk. So, so and so is after my life. He, he talks private things and it's been recorded there. And once the politician moves out, then they start the blip me. And say, so we've got information about you. You need to do one, two, three for me. So this, this uh, 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 spiritual purpose, they are controlling even the government in a sense that they've got things against our political leaders. And they use it as a blackmail. So I can say that the national security, uh, Mr. Chair, is at risk. Because no matter what we can do these spiritual fathers are able to escape where you close the door and you'll ask yourself how did you come out is because of power extra power not spiritual power they have the spiritual power and they have the political influence so dealing with them you are dealing with a deep government within our government that is the reason why they encourage it's been ushered by the government cars, policemen. When the pastor goes to church, the policemen, the traffic cops, they usher this person. These people, they've got diplomats, passports. When they go to the airport, it's because they've got spiritual powers, which they are using against the politician. So at the end of the day, you find that our government is not only controlled by the parliament, but our government is controlled through an office of a spiritual father who is seated down somewhere else. Thank you so much. Uh, before I give uh, commissioners a word, uh, let me um, continue. Uh, I know the role of the commission and the violation of the freedom of religion, so to speak. What, what can be done in your case? Thank you so much. I think what needs to be done is conversation. We need a conversation in the villages, in our community, in the local halls, because bringing a, 
a conversation, not only a, a conversation that brings uh, the churches only, but a conversation that brings everybody, all this religion coming, including the traditional. And we sit down and have this conversation and we allow people to ask questions because these are, remember, it, in this case, it is the pastor who is wrong. It is not the multitude. But the victims are the multitude. So it means that the multitude has to be educated. And education comes through conversation. We need to talk about this. You know, Mr. Chet, when I came out and tried to talk about my experience, a lot of pastors, they, they fought me. They hated me because they said, what you are saying is not something that should not be talked about. But guess what? Since I started to talk about this thing, they have stopped prophesying people using their ID number because I revealed that. So the more we have a conversation and we, we talk about this thing, it will become less because what is hidden, it is now exposed. So if we move and uh, bring a conversation where people, even the victim, they, they have been given a chance, the community, to talk, Mr. Che, I can say, proudly so and say there are more that you are still going to hear what you have heard last week there are more who are in their houses they are crying and they can't come here but they need that conversation in their community there are older women who have been raised by young men who are called spiritual fathers and others they even died performing those kinds of things so there is more in our community and the community wants to talk and they don't know where to talk because I try to talk. I was silenced by the pastors. They said, no, you can't talk. But I was bold enough and said, I am talking my story here. So we need the commission to go to the people, hear them. And after hearing them, may the commission have a, a, a particular manual where it will give these people on how to identify cult churches, distribute it, and distribute, let people understand. We need the arts who will come also, perform dramas about this, because other people, they don't hear by, uh, they don't understand by hearing, but they understand by performance. We need dramas on this. We need to come together because this elephant, uh, 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 Mr. Che, it needs a community to deal with it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Over to Thank you so much. I would say these practices, they can also be found in traditional doctors. There are traditional doctors who have went somewhere to acquire extra powers as well. And they use the very same practice which the pastors are using. But in the traditional, it, it, it is, you can't see it because of they are able to, to tell you and say it is the ancestors who said we must do this. So they, they have a way of manipulating it. So the reason why it is more vocal in the church it is because it's a new thing. We don't understand this. Because the Bible says sex before marriage is sin. So yet the pastor is practicing that. So we also have uh, people, business people, who go and acquire extra power. We also have uh, top influential people who've got, who've got houses, big houses. They are not married. And, and this power, uh, the instruction was said, you don't marry. They've got money to pay law order, but they stay alone. So this is a practice that has been there for some time. It is just that now a lot of religious leaders have decided and have abundant prayer and acquired this power. So it is killing the church and killing families. But if one person is using for their own personal things, that is something else. But now they are using this to enrich themselves at the expense of their followers. And most of these victims, their lives, if they don't get deliverance, their life becomes shattered because of they are condemned spiritually, they are hurt emotionally. So when you deal with this, 
you need to deal with it holistically, which we need professionals, psychologists, to come in and be able to counsel these people because a lot of things have been damaged in their, in their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mbele. I will say that uh, this cult, they, they, they mix, as I've said earlier on, that they mix a lot of religious practices. But because we are here in Africa, in South Africa, in an African context, there is a high influence of the African spirituality in these churches. In a sense that in an African religion, they give you muti, which is, it comes from a tree. Now, in these churches, they know they can't give you muti. They'll give you an oil, which comes from the same tree. So just because it is oil that is packaged well, but coming from the same source, it is the same practice. And in this church, they will tell you that because you used to give to your ancestors, now you should give a certain amount of money. It is the same practice. You used to give to your ancestors, you are used to this thing, that every year you give a cow to uh, your ancestors. Now you must bring that cow to the men of God. So it is the same practices. And in the African uh, spirituality, you go, you consult. Here, they, don't, uh, they call it one-on-one. -on -one. It is the same practice. So, Chair, actually here, we are dealing with a modified African religion that is camouflaged as a Christian church. The issue, uh, I think, we need to come to the chase, cut it to the chase. Um, CRL is not a police uh, commission for religious practices. We cannot police them. Uh, CRL is only concerned that practices that emanate from religion should not violate the rights and the human dignity of our people. That's the bottom line. It should not turn our people into zombies. Mm. Yeah? It should not turn, don't hypnotize them. Don't use practices that uh, would let them um, use their resources without thinking. If they have to think to give resources on their own, you call it voluntary. But the involuntary giving as a result of some kind of uh, practices that accompanies that, we have heard people say, I've been in poverty. You can't give beyond your capacity to give. It has to be clear to you. So, so, so people must understand the role of the commission. It's not a police asset or a police commission of the religious, cultural and religious organization. We are saying each and every religion, culture, linguistic, adhere to the constitution and its intent. Anything that does not align to that, it will not make the, this commission happen. And of course, the council will not be able to that. We don't want to hear the cries of women, children, even men who are under exploitative environments and uh, being abused. People come to us. We don't go to communities and invite them. They come here. And religious leaders, when they hear their own members, talking about their own suffering, they then blame CRL. As if we have created the problem. We don't create problems. So when they create problems, people want to get the problem solved. Where do they come? CRL. Now when we deal with the problem, they say, no, CRL is now working against us. 
we, we don't gain against anybody. Mm. It is the people who have been violated, who feel aggrieved, who say, CRM, please help us. So we allow people to speak and tell their own story. And the aim is to bear. The aim is to construct a new society in the context of the new constitution. And we want to promote loyalty to the country, loyalty to its people. That's what our role, our role is all about. Okay? Is there anything? It would appear we have had a very good uh, morning with you, uh, Ms. Kosky. Thank you so much. Um, I only forgot to ask you how, at least you said something about your initiative. I wanted to check the concoction that you gave. Did you see what is inside the concoction that you gave? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to know the, the concoction, but, but it did work, sir. It did work for you. Yeah. Uh, after I, I have buried the head of a pig mm. without any doing extra program, I saw people flocking to church. Mm. So I can say I saw, yeah, it did work. Yeah. Okay. But those people who are flocking to church are not people who are looking for the word of God. Those are people who come for prophecy, prosperity, and other things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. No, I, I thought I was concluding, but I can see <laughs> there, there's more interest, but I can't stop you. I can't stop you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Captain Sally. I just want to take notes for how did you manage to come out of the system? I think you forgot to talk about it. Okay. Thank you so much. When I was, I, I was there, as I've said, that I acquired more power, what happened is that one day while I was doing consultation, people were coming to my house from 4 o'clock in the morning queuing for one-on-one -on -one consultation because this power will attract. This power gives you fame. It, it, it makes people to, to think that they don't mind traveling and coming to wait at the gate before you can start practicing. So people were flocking at my house from four o'clock in the morning. So I was doing one-on-one -on -one there in, in my house, in social Google by then. Now, one morning as I was there, three policemen came and they said, we are looking for Makado. They called me by name and they said, we are looking for you for a mutilation case where you, uh, mutilation, it is a practice of dealing with human body parts. That was in social Google by then. Now they arrested me and I went to Hoshimampuru prison for that particular case. And uh, I was going through trial. What happened is that as I was practicing as a false prophet, people came with human body parts. They came to me and said, we are saving you this so that it can boost you. So that you can be more successful. So I saw them, but I did not buy them. Now, what happened is that when the policemen came, they had a case of a, somebody whose body parts has been uh, chopped off and they arrested the suspects. So they were looking and tracing where the suspect went. So they came to me because the suspect came to me as well. So in that case, I even helped the police people to tell them these people they came and they said they wanted to sell me the body parts and i did not buy them and i showed them where they have hidden these body parts i took the police people and i showed them and the police they found the exhibit then after that what happened is that i was acquitted from the case because they could not find anything that linked me as a buyer from those people and once I was acquitted from that particular case, I spoke and said, you know what? This is not the life that I want to live. I want to come out of this kind of lifestyle. So that is where my turning around came while I was in prison. I started to say, I am turning around from this. The second thing that happened is that I stopped going to church. I said, I'm stopping and I'm going back home where I need rehabilitation, restoration and deliverance and i spoke to my parents and they they prayed for me i stayed home for some time 
And I said, what I have done, I'm no longer waiting to be a pastor. I said, no, I'm sitting down. I applied for a job. I was a driver, a courier driver. I moved around as a driver. Up until one day as I was driving, the same call came to me and said, this is not the life that I was called you for. And I wrote a letter to the Apostolic Faith Mission. And I asked them to come back because that is where I got my training. And the Apostolic Faith Mission gave me a process and said, before we can accept you, you need to go back and serve uh, under one pastor. After you have served, the pastor will monitor you. And once they are satisfied, they will be able to give you the license. I did that part. After I've done that part, after I've served, I was reordained by the church. And after I was reordained by the church, there was a church in Sibuke, uh, Zone 10, the AFM. They advertised that they are looking for a pastor. I sent my CV to apply in that church. I went for the interview in that church and I was appointed to be the pastor at that church. So today as I'm here, I am employed in that church. The gentlemen that I came with, they are the elders of the church. Their minds have been best, and they are able to, you know, to be normal people as they were born. I don't care what normality is, but I would just say that normal. Okay. What I have done when I said that I am stopping this, I, I closed the church and I spoke to them that uh, I'm no longer a pastor, and I advised them to look for a church that preaches the true gospel. Mm. And uh, I did not end there. I approached one national newspaper where I public, uh, publicly apologize because part of healing is when you are able to confront your, your mistakes and you say to people I am sorry for what I've done and my recommendation is that look for a, a better church then others they looked for a better church we are still in communication I was telling my wife the other day and said you know it, it's so strange that once you, you have wronged somebody and they still send you WhatsApp and say we are proud of you of the work that you are doing to this nation. From hearing such messages from them, it gives me strength. So I did not end there. I, I move around with churches that invite me trying to bring this awareness. So I think that the best way is when you give a person knowledge. So this is what I've done to share this knowledge so that people's consciousness can know the truth.